Good morning, everyone. Um, I know you can all hear me really well without a microphone, but then we are recording the session so that it's just for the benefit of kind of everybody so that in the future, if you ever have a new staff of, on board or you want to review the session again, it's going to be available online. And I'll give you the link after this. So um, welcome, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Ann Wong, and uh, I'm from the city of Warner Creek, and I will be going over the annual rental monitoring report. So this is kind of the things that I'll go over today. Uh, you have PowerPoint slides to help you follow through. I'll give you an introduction to what the monitoring is, uh, the process of how to you know, submit, and then I'll go through Smartsheets just briefly. It's the web browser that we use to submit all of our reports. And then I will take some time to go over the city review portion about exactly kind of, I, I review the report, so I'll kind of get take you backstage about what I do and what I look for uh, to help clarify the process. And then uh, I'd like to take a moment to talk about a topic of interest that I find that through my experience some people have stated their confusion about, and that's distinguishing between city limits and actual limits and requirements. So that's a topic I'll talk more about later, and then I'll open it up for questions. So what kind of what the annual monitoring is, and a little bit of background, is that the City of Wanna Creek monitors subsidized affordable or restricted inclusionary housing rental units annually. Mainly, this monitoring checks com properties compliance with the regulatory agreements. Additionally, if a property has one or more loans with the city, this monitoring reviews the property's financials and tracks the progress of the loan with the city. So a couple facts or key points is that every property has a due date and we've provided a calendar for you to list the due dates of when each property is. So every property must have a point of contact person. It's usually the property manager um, and that they're responsible for submitting and completing the report. So monitoring submittals are done on Smartsheets, which is a website. Monitoring is suggested to be done after property certification, and I think that's a good time because that's when uh, property managers receive all the updated information about their tenants and their units. And the monitoring year is always due the next year. Um, and we do this because we, I, you know, City of Wild Creek, we have 18 properties, and every property, it has their due date at a different date. So then we give the entire year for the, for the properties to get all of their 2018 information. Um, for example, a property, their annual monitoring due date could be December 31st. So we give that property the entire year, and that's why all the due dates are going to be due on, in 2019. So, you, so every property essentially ha has a lot of time, you know, to complete their report because I don't think any property has a due date uh, has a due date of like December thirty first. Um, and then reports are based on the report year and not the due date year. So, example, the two thousand eighteen monitoring, it's due in two. 2019 and it's always all the information is always going to be based on 2018. So the process, so how does it work? So I usually send you a notify send the properties a notification uh, both in mail and through email in about in one month in advance of the due date, just saying that it's going to be due soon. So the property managers, they submit the report, and I kind of break down this presentation or the submittal parts into three main sections, and that's the rent and income, the financials, and the attachments that need to be submitted. So property managers or point of contact, they submit the report, and then the city reviews it, reviews all the information that you submitted, 
and then um, and if there's any questions, which in the past I've have found that there are, um, I'll ask the property managers to get more information or to clarify, et cetera. And then finally, if it's when it's completed, I will send you a completion confirmation via email. So this is what smart sheets look like, the website. It's easy to remember, www.smartsheets.com. And a couple of things about smart sheets um, is that, as I've stated, every property must have at least one point of contact uh, to be accountable and to have an account. So they have to do a 30, about a 30 minute on the phone online training with the smart sheets coordinator. Her name's Tam Lee. So she'll set up, so Tam Lee, she's the person in with Smartsheet, she'll set up an account, she'll do all the technical work. So in the future, if there's kind of any technical issues or our staff needs to get training for Smartsheets, the first, the main contact person would be Tam Lee. And so smart, so the next couple of slides, they're gonna be screenshots of Smartsheets. I'm kind of gonna run through them with you and then I'm gonna actually go on smartsheets.com to do a quick run through of kind of where everything is. But it will be very brief because um, when you do that 30 minute training session with Tan Lee, she goes through that in greater detail. So. A couple of things is if you log on Smartsheets, you'll see a couple tabs. It's kind of like Google Sheets, um, but there are a bunch of Excel sheets. So you'll see the Home tab, and then actually there's a right side menu where you can see information about your properties, and they're in folder formats. And actually, if you scroll all the way down, you can click All, and then there's something that shows you all of the sheets. They're all in alphabetical order, so you can re you can find your property. So it, it looks like this. So a bunch of sheets, and then on your, I'm mean, sorry, on your left side, you'll see the menu with your properties and your folders. You scroll all the way down, click all, this will come up. It's all in alphabetical order. And you wanna go to the rental properties and your report year, which is 2018. We're, we're going in our 2018 report. Click that. It goes to this kind of master summary page of all the properties listed. Um, you're only concerned with your own property, so um, next to your property, you can find that little clip, that paper clip, where you can attach all your attachments. Um, in addition, if you click that paper clip, you'll also see uh, useful information and resources, such as your regulatory agreements, um, a template of the utility allowance or your loan agreements, whatever information we tr we try to provide as much um, to help you. Okay. Oh, and then um, if you go to your rent and, and income sheet, it'll look like this. This is a list of things that we look for that you'll have to fill out that I'll check. And then the financial sheet will look something like that. Again, you fill it out. And for the attachments, you, it's on your master sheet. You click, the, you click the paper clip, and then it'll take you to this uh, box right here, and you click the blue button, attach. Um, and as you can, I use the mouse. As you can see, the resources that I was referring to are already here, such as your utility, such as a blank utility allowance form, your rental agreements, um, and your loan agreements if you have a city loan. And then you can click attach, looks like this, to upload your own files. And then when you're done with everything, you can click all these check boxes to check that you've done it. And when and upon completion of the report, I will check this box right here. This is city verified complete. All right, so I'm gonna take you to the browser to go through kind of what I just went through, but on the actual website. So smartsheets.com, click login. So you enter your email. Okay. So 
loading. Uh, okay, so it'll look like this. Um, sorry. So when you first log in, it'll look like this because this is your home, right? Mm -hmm. And then these are all the sheets. They're all in alphabetical order. So you can cut. You, so this is one way. Like for example, Alkalani's, all of their their stuff is over here, right? All of their tabs. Um, that's one way of looking at it. Or you can look at your left side panel, and you can see that your your properties and the folders are all here, right? So if I was an Alkalani's property manager, I'd look at the Alkalani's and click the 2018 because that's the report that's going to be due. I click that, and when I do, it's, it shows the financial sheets and then the rent income sheet. So I can click on the rent income sheet. It'll look like this. So that's where you know I, I start filling out everything about my property. And if I want to go back to home, and if I want to fill out something about my financials, I click that. It'll lead to my financial sheet. I fill out the stuff about my loans. Oh, and, and also, your loan information is generally going to be over here. So Alkalani's, they have a city loan of $1.2 million. And you know, it's going to be different for every property who has a, who has a loan with the city. And then I go and I go back to home, right? And then I can scroll all the way down to the all reports, right? And to find my master report, I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the rental properties, right? And the report year, right? It's 2018. That's where that's what we're interested in. So I click that one. And then see this is the master sheet of all the properties and just basic information about it. If I wanna find out more information about my property, Arboleta, for example, I click on the paper clip. And currently, there's all the resources, right? Like your rent and income limits, your utility allowance, um, that's blank. And then all of the, the city loan agreements, resources like that. And then if I want to attach things, I click the attach, you can attach things. Um, and when you complete everything you can start checking it off it's a the checklist i find is a good way to just make sure that you know you have everything that you're supposed to to check it off so that is kind of a basic quick overview of smart sheets i'm going to go back to the presentation slideshow okay so now I'll take you back to um, the city review side. So when you submit the report, what is it that I do? So I export everything you submit, and then I start reviewing it chunk by chunk, you know, the section by section, rent and income, the financials, and then the attachments. So you know, these are kind of the main things that I look for or I check. So when I export the rent and income sheet, I do something like this, and I'll show you exactly the sheet that a template of the Excel sheet. So it's kind of small, but so I'll, I'll make it larger. But it looks like this, essentially. Um, can everybody kind of see it better? Okay. So so this is kind of the key that I start out with. Everything in black, the city ma uh, the property manager entered on Smartsheets. Um, and everything in red, it's kind of like the city staff entered the notes. And then the blue and green are fixed calculations or checkpoints. So I start off with the first column, right, is the unit count. So this example, there's 11 units. So I'll look into your regulatory agreements and actually your past reports. So if the regulatory agreement states that this property has 12 units and I see that there's 11, well, that's a red flag, right? Like what happened to your other unit? So I'll, I'll kind of comment on that. So we can go through it one by one. I can show you a couple examples. So, you know, your tenant name, the rent, okay. 
So the utility allowance. So I've entered this one because this is the utility allowance you submitted on your, on your UA sheet. So for example, right, we can say that the three bedroom, it has an allowance of $82, right? So I put 82 right here. However, it turns out that the, the property manager at the report put that, put $90. So that's a mismatch. So that's a red flag for me. So what I do is I convert that to a comment at the end and just say one unit 101, UA charge does not match UA sheet. So that's one red flag, right? And everything else is okay. So I go to the next unit, right? It says overcharging rent, it's not okay. So because it says it's 41. So this unit has an overcharged rent of $41. So I'll write that into a comment, right? over here um, and so forth right so every so so pretty much I review the whole sheet to make sure that you know kind of generally does everything make sense you know does everything look normal right and then I actually use these green checkpoints so if at any point um, the green does not say okay that's a red flag I'll look at it you know and they're all form they're all form formulas on Excel to kind of spit this result out and then I'll take a closer look at it and then I'll make it into a comment if I need to, right? So that's that's one way, right? And then actually another way that I have been checking for just kind of everything um, and I thought I'd share this with you now is that on your attachments, on your package, you'll also find um, this sheet right here that I printed out, it's, um, it helps me and it'll probably help you kind of sort it out between your, your units, so your unit mix and your AMI or affordability mix. So if you, if you print it out, I mean, well, if you complete it, this is just a, a sample, it'll kind of look like this. So, so there is a difference between city AMI limits and actual AMI limits. It's kind of hard to see from here. But, and I'll review this a little bit more in detail later, but the difference is that one property can be regulated by multiple regulatory agreements. Because, I mean, that's, that's kind of the affordable housing field, is that affordable housing, to build an affordable housing project, you actually have to have a bunch of funding sources and every funding source requires a regulatory agreement and they require their own set of agreements. The city is just one of those resources. Like, I mean, for example, uh, Riviera is a city of Warner Creek um, affordable housing building. It, it just got built. Um, it was built by RCD, but the city, we loaned them six million dollars to build that 58 units so we we put in a little funding of our but does the whole building cost six million no it'll cost way more right riviera got a bunch of other funding sources that also had their own set of requirements so back to the city ami and the actual ami limits is that sometimes other regulatory agreements requires deeper affordability more restrictions on that unit on that property and a one property, they have to comply to everything, right? So for me, because I represent the city, I look, I pay the most attention to what my regulatory agreement says and make sure that properties follow that. But I also understand that there are other requirements. So that produces a, either a deeper or equal affordability level. And I care about the actual AMI because it's, because it tells the actual designated units for the un for the property, and we use that as a resource when we, you know, when we do our reports, when we give information to the public. I mean, because I just feel like it's wrong when someone from the public asks um, how many units are at 30% AMI in. Riviera and I say well according to the city regulations we say that you know all 100 units are restricted to 50% but in that but in reality it's not because 
they're, they have deeper restrictions, right? So that's why we, this is really important. But we have these two charts, and this is kind of how I split them up like that. So that's another way of checking my work, and I think that it's a great resource. I'm biased, obviously, um, but it could be useful, so check it out. Um, going back to the presentation. All right. So, yes, so I kind of went through what I review for the rent and income sheet, and going back to that sheet about distinguishing between city AMI and actual AMI, these are kind of the main questions that I ask myself um, when I'm checking the sheets. So, and this is, I think that these are great questions to ask yourself when you're filling them out, right? Is that number one, like does the number of units match the regulatory agreement or the building, right? Like, so that's why I check right here, right? That's the whole, are there actually 18 units in this building? If there are more, then they're not getting reported. That's a red flag, right? Um, do the number of bedrooms match in this year and last year's report, right? I mean, I mean, do, yeah, are the, are the number of bedrooms fine, right? Because there's no way that in this year, you know, unit 101 was a one, is a one bedroom, but last year it says unit 101 was like a three bedroom, right? There, there's, there's gotta be something going on there, right? So that's kind of what I ask myself. And then are the city AMI limits equal to or greater than the actual AMI limits? So remember, one property follows a lot of regulatory restrictions. You have to follow the most restrictive in order to comply with all of your requirements. Um, and then does the bedroom mix match, right? Because there's, there's no way that uh, in this chart it says like, you know, there's a there's three one bedrooms and then on this chart maybe it'll say that there are four one bedrooms like it it wouldn't make sense you know it's kind of the smell test right and does the total number of unit match right when you do all your calculations so I think that's a great checkpoint for me and I think it would be a good checkpoint for you um, okay so moving on to the financial sheet section um, it looks like this very similar, I mean, it is a screenshot of uh, what you would submit on your smart sheets. And pretty much it tracks the progress of the loan, right? Um, for example, this example says that there's a principal sum of $4 million. So we track that. So as in this year, is this property paying any portion of that $4 million loan? If so, how much? Loans have principles and they have interest. We, we want to ask what, if you're paying a sum, what portion of that goes to the principal and what portion of that goes to interest? And of course, after you pay that portion, how much of the entire loan have you paid and how much of it do you have left to pay? So th these are basic kind of progress tracking of your, of your loan. And the source is very important. Um, I really need to know where these numbers come from if you fill them out. Usually, I would say that most of them would come from your financial audit report. So for example, right, um, your cash flow, it comes from your financial audit report, page 26. I'll go to your financial audit report, page 26, and oh, look, it's right there. You know, so I, I really have to see the loan, see the source, it's, it's very important to just make sure and to verify that that number came from somewhere. So it, so if you don't fill out, and, and if you don't owe any money to the city for that loan, which is very common by the way, so don't worry about it, um, put a zero, like, but don't leave it blank because then I'll know and then I'll be able to check. Um, and somewhere in your financial audit report, it'll state what, what the property owes to the city and I, I'll need that as a source. And then the last chunk is the attachment portion. So every property, they have to attach a fill out utility allowance sheet because that's kind of how I check for your utility allowance when I do your rent calculation to see. So going back to the rent and income sheet. And a filled out 
utility allowance looks like this. And for a city, I mean, for a property who has a city loan or loans, they have to submit their financial audit report, their budget, um, and their loan information. Um, and I think for all properties, if there are other items specific to your regulatory agreements that are stated, you have to submit those too. Like, for example, I know one property, it says on, the re on their regulatory agreement that they have to submit like this separate county report or like this other property that says that they have to submit um, residential information pertaining to like where they used to live. So that's not typical, right? But on that regulatory agreement, it says that they have to. So that's what they have to report. Um, okay, so I guess going back to our hot topic, um, I just wanna kinda quickly go around the room. Um, who, f who knows, who can distinguish between like this concept of city versus actual AMI? Okay, okay, it's, it's good, okay. So I, I will go on and explain it. So I'll use this, um, I'll use an example and take you through it, but I'll explain it. So what is the difference between city AMI limits and actual AMI limits? City AMI limits are stated on the city regulatory agreement, while actual AMI limits are the AMI limit designated to the unit due to all restrictions from every regulatory agreement the property is under. So for example, one property could have funding from tax credits, they could have money from the county, from CDBG, or from home, from the city, etc. And then all of these funding sources, they required the property to do certain things to restrict their units to a certain income and rent limit. And cities, city or other agencies slash agreements have, may have different requirements and or deeper affordability levels. And most of the time they do. So a quick example is a city may restrict limits to 50% AMI, but then they also receive money from the county, and the county restricts those units to 30% AMI. So a property must follow the most restrictive option to meet all requirements. So the city limit is actually 50% AMI because that's what's stated on the regulatory agreement. But in reality, that those units are restricted to 30% AMI because that's what the county restricts. And you have to follow the most restrictive one. So I'll take you through a more detailed version of an example. So an example is that you have a 100 unit property and it received funding or is restricted to these following. So they got, t they got California tax credit, which requires all their units at 60% AMI. They also borrowed money from the city, and the city requires 50% of the units at 60 AMI and 30% of their units at 50 AMI. And they also received money from the county and from home. So you take a look at the wording, right, of all of these. And you see that there's so many percentages, right? And it, it's, it, it, could, it is confusing, it's complicated. Um, so what do you do? So I would say, look at the key, key things. Your percentage of units and the affordability level. Um, and what source it's referring to. So these are kind of the three things. So how, how I would do it, right? I mean, I'm sure there are several ways, but this is my method, um, is that I start off with a blank chart. I list down exactly all of the regulatory um, agreements that the property is under, right? And all of the kind of um, AMI levels or affordability levels they're under. And then I just, fall, I just break them down. So let's go through number one. California tax 
credit requires 100% of the units at 60 AMI, right? So 100% of 100 units is, yes, 100 units. So I put 100 units under 60%, right? Next line. City of Water Creek requires 50% of units at 60 AMI. Stop right there. So 50% of 100 is 50. So 50 units need to be at 60 AMI. Next line. 30% of the units at 50 AMI. So 30% of a 100 unit property is 30. Oh. So it will be 30 units at the, on the, in that slot. County requires 20% of the units at 50. Home requires 15% of the units at 30. So they're kind of all placed into the chart, right? So that correlates with the statements. And these statements are going to be found in your regulatory agreements. So now, right, like how, how do you find, how do you figure out the, the mix to be able to comply with all of them? Okay. So you have to pick the most restrictive, right? So I start off with the most restrictive. I start with 30% AMI. So it says home requires 15 units. So you put down 15 units at 30. And then here's a slightly tricky part. You don't add it, you do not add it, okay? What you do is, so for the 50% AMI, the city requires 30 units and the county requires 20. So you know that it's 30 units that have to be 50% AMI. Because if you only put 20 units, you're violating the city's agreement because the city requires 30%, right? I mean, 30 units. Um, but actually, the answer, the actual AMI, would be you restrict 15 units at 50% AMI because the other 15 units that add up to 30 is at 30 AMI. So you're satisfying this 50 this 50% 50 right here because, because you have 30 units at or below 50%. And in every agreement with these AMIs, it's always going to be at or below. Like that's, that's it. Like they're never going to restrict you to say that. You have to have exactly 30 units at exactly 50% AMI. They are not going to do that. It's always at or below or at least. Like those are the words. So, so in reality, you could have 30 units at 50% AMI and 15 units at 30 AMI. But for a property to be smart, and they usually are, they're going to put 30, they're going to put 15 units at 50 and the other 15 units at 30 to meet this, this requirement. So we're, we're here. And then now we go to the third tier, right? The 60% AMI. So there's 70 units at 60% AMI and not 100 because 15 plus 15 plus 70 equals 100. So that's how you meet all of them. So you, this is how you're meeting all the requirements. You are dedicating 15 units at 30. You are dedicating 30 units at or below 50% AMI because you're also you're also overlapping those units with 30%. And all 100% of your units are at or below 60% AMI. Because you're, you're kind of overlapping them. So it turns out your actual AMI limits are you reserve 15 units at 30 AMI, 15 units at 50 AMI, and 70 units at 60 AMI. So this is, this is kind of the difference that I would really want you to take away from this because for me, I represent the city, right? And I'm going to regulate the city agreement. So the city, I have to make sure that you have, you have at least 30, 30 units at at least 50 AMI and 50 units at 60. But in reality, the whole building is restricted to this much. So that's why it could be very, very different when you have all of these other players, right? You can see that it's, it's clear that the city AMI limits and the actual AMI limits are different. Okay. 
And, and also to note that unfortunately, unfortunately complicates things a little bit more or that something that you have to be careful about is that the sources that they're referring to, it's different. Some require, so some funding sources require you to base your income and rent limits on HCD limits, which is all right here, right? Some funding sources will require you to look at HUD limits, and some are only one, but it's a big one, right? It's the California uh, tax credit allowance. They have their own set of specific dollar amounts. So they're all very similar, but there are slight differences. Like HCD, for, for a family of four people, extremely low according to HCD is $34,850. But according to TCAT, a four-person extremely low is actually $34,860. And you can see that there's a substantial difference. Like when they talk about the same thing, their dollar amount is different. So you have to be careful and you have to actually look at the sources. So the lesson here, there's a couple lessons. A property must comply to all regulatory agreements. All regulatory agreements may have different requirements, different affordability levels, and different income and rent limits. A property must follow the most restrictive requirement. That's the only way it can fully comply with all requirements. And, and I, don't, I don't think I have to remind you that properties, they, they do have to follow and comply with all the requirements. Um, it's, it's written down, it's legal, and if you breach it, then, you know, that, that's bad. I mean, so when in doubt, read all regulatory agreements for your property and work with your compliance and legal staff and even your financial staff to figure out the financial uh, section of it. I, I kind of want to stop right there and and just kind of ask. I, I do have one more example, um, which is kind of an analogy example to kind of and it's simple and it's more simple. But I wanted to ask how you feel about this concept. Like, would you like me to walk you through another like like it's well well the other example that I have in mind it's um it's it doesn't have any numbers. But I just wanted to know how comfortable you are. Who who wants me to go over another example? Who doesn't? All right, all right. Then we are good to. Go. I mean, so it's pretty much the end of my presentation or what I have. Um, but I guess I guess I have a couple things. Um, you know, please be prompt. Um, be thorough. I mean, please, please be thorough. You know, you know, I, I have 18 properties of these to go through. You know, so, so I, I feel it's it's complicated. It could get very complicated. Um, but please be thorough. You know, the more thorough you are, um, and actually the more that you communicate to me, um, I would say the easier it is for the both of us. Because like, um, if properties don't communicate to me, there's going to be so much back and forth with the emails, right? So, so if you feel like w as you're submitting the application, I mean, as, as you're submitting the report, if you feel like, if you feel like you're entering information but you know that I'm going to ask you questions or, or it may sound confusing, you, you, should, you should just um, note that and just explain it for me, you know, so that I don't have to email you back and ask you those questions. But, so well, um, thank you so much for spending some of your morning with me. And I'm, I'll be available for questions. And Samantha, our housing intern, she does not have a wireless mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> Originally, we were going to have a wireless mic. But if you have any questions, um, feel free to use those two table mics, pass them around, and ask your questions so they get recorded.
<laughs> okay, so the question was, um, so Jackie, she's from Riviera, and this is going to be her first time um, because Riviera is a brand new property. Yay! Um, yes, I I will be, um, and a lot, and I'll say that a lot of properties. Um, last year was my first kind of training. Um, and there were still a lot of, um, you know, hiccups and, and things like that. But, but generally, um, I would say the process isn't as simple as kind of what I showed you, you know, those four steps you submit, I ask you questions, and then it's complete. Because actually, there's been a lot of times many properties, they we, we do go back and forth. Um, I would like that to, you know, be minimized, but that is the reality. So, you know, we work with that. One of my issues is that um, our Riviera consists of two buildings. It's one property with two buildings. Right. Uh, the first building, everybody moved in, we're good. Now we're waiting on the um, state inspection for the second building. So there is going to be a difference on the research. So you were saying about nobody has on, you know, deadline of December 31st which I think we might have a deadline of December 31st. Um, we're hoping to get the building before the end of the month, which I doubt it. Um, so everybody will be moving in December mm -hmm. or the majority of the families will be moving in December. So what I really want to know is like, when would my report be due? Because we have two separate buildings and one has is already come full and the other one is still waiting for that is an excellent question um and although it does it is specific i will apply it generally so first is that for your annual recertification that's a different process but i just suggested that you fill out the monitoring report after you do your recertification because it's the same information, but it's just different reports. It just makes it easier for every property manager, right? So that's number one. Um, so if you have two buildings, do your annual recertification whenever, you know, your, your supervisor or, you know, your policy, right? Whenever it permits, right? Um, but for you, but I am aware that you have one property that moved in and another property that, you know, is still waiting on certificate of occupancy so specifically for Riviera you are in two different properties um, which is I think the, the only one um, I will be doing the monitoring for all 58 units so both properties at the same time I'll just tell you that right now um, the thing is when you read your regulatory agreement it says that your report due date is due a year and the years after the the certificate of occupancy for both properties have been finalized so technically at this moment right now because one of your buildings have not received certificate of occupancy you will not at this point you are not required to submit a report but we know that you know, we all know that Riviera for the other, for the second property, it will be occupied soon, right? You say sometime in December. So if you, so if your property gets occupied in January 2019, your next report actually probably will not be due until like January 2020. But I still have to do the one for the first building or no? So I, w so I would say for Riviera, because you're occupying your units in, I think, in September and in December, I would say that you don't need to submit the 2018 report, but maybe the 2019, because you just haven't gotten all your tenant um, information. But okay, we can but talk we'll, more we about can that. We can keep in touch just to make sure that I'm not failing on not doing that report. <laughs> yes, yes, okay. yes. I, I, I will, I will bother people if, they, if they're supposed to submit something and they didn't. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Are these reports public? Th these reports. No, they're not. Yes, they are not, and that's actually why. Okay. 
Okay, all right. Well, you know, there's no questions. I don't want to stand in your way to your other morning stuff. So, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, There's bagels and coffee in the back of the room. So feel free to grab some. And yeah, thank you.